Well, welcome everybody to Society 2045 Friday Talks, where we interview people from around the world that are involved in movements and communities that are changing the world and making society a better place. Our goal is to see who and how we're going to get to Society 2045 and make it a better place to live. Today, we've got with us Glenn Meyer, who's going to tell us about what uh, movements he's involved with and what work he's doing. And so welcome, Glenn, and tell us about what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. So I think the best way to describe it is that um, I am, am part of both the integrative law movement, which um, I know everybody has heard about from Kim Wright, uh, and I'm part of what, what I like to call the business as a force for good movement. I really started learning about that second part, oh gosh, I would say probably about eight years ago now, really interested at that time, I'd been practicing law for a little over 20 years and was immediately interested and curious in what kind of service a, a business community that was focused on doing good in the world would need from their lawyers. Um, and it was actually that search that led me to Kim. Um, and and here we are uh so it, another thing that that kind of informs the the area that i focus on is the fact that uh throughout my legal career uh, i've been involved in litigation uh mostly civil litigation i did spend a few years as a, um, a military attorney in the air force uh and uh, dealt with military uh, criminal legal issues there, but ever since uh, I got out of the service, it's been all civil work and largely focused around uh, business dispute. That's really uh, what has started me asking the question of, uh, you know, what do uh, people who are part of this good business movement need from their lawyers? And specifically, what do they need in terms of um, forming agreements uh, and then resolving disagreements when they come up. Uh, and so very uh, much a fan of conscious contracts. I think everybody's heard about that work before. Uh, I have used those in the business context. Uh, and up till fairly recently have been thinking of that work on a very uh, micro level. So kind of relationship by relationship. So if I helped a group of co-founders uh, create a conscious contract among them uh, and have their own process for how they were gonna surface and resolve tensions among them, I was like, okay, that's good. And recently through some conversations I've had with people, I've kind of been invited into the space of well, what does this look like? Not, not so much on a micro case by case level, but what does it look like on a macro level where these kind of agreements are helping govern relationships throughout a whole system? And so I guess that's what leads me to, to my answer to the question of what does the legal system look like in 2045? Um, and, and, and I think um, it is, it is a, a multifaceted look that it will have. So there will be a piece of it that I think will be very recognizable to everybody because it will look much like the current system. Um, I think that the current system is most focused on uh, how do you protect people from bad actors? And how do you redress injury that's caused uh, by bad actors? And because of that, I think the, the 
system as it currently exists is kind of constrained to what we can do is we can establish a minimal uh, uh, floor for what is acceptable behavior. But there's really not a lot of capacity in the current system for people who say, well, we have floors are all well and good, but we're interested in going way above the floor. And how can we do that together? And I think that's the part of the legal system that will be around in 2045 that is much less emerged today. Like we're seeing very small pieces of it, I think, in the idea of conscious contracts. We're seeing it in the restorative justice movement. We're seeing it in um, collaborative uh, dispute resolution practices. So all of that stuff is coming and there, there is, in my experience, a, a significant hunger for it on the part of clients. And a, a thing that I point to regularly uh, is the fact that it is very common in, um, in commercial contracts these days to have a clause that, that says, before anybody goes off and files any legal action, we're gonna sit down and we're gonna resolve, we're gonna make our best efforts to resolve this matter in good faith. And to me, that's a, that's a, a cry for a non-adversarial approach. And all we have to offer is an adversarial framework. And even at, even at this point, when we um, offer what look like non-adversarial frameworks to resolve things, I think their effectiveness is pretty limited. Like those clauses that I talked about in contracts, obviously I'm not gonna see the situations where it works because then they're not gonna come to, uh, of, to see a lawyer. But I, I've certainly seen a lot of examples of those clauses failing. And I think it's because there is a real specific framework to do things in one way and then zero framework at all to do them in the operative way. And I, th I think what, because of that, the, the adversarial mindset kind of bleeds over into even when they try and do things collaboratively. So we, uh, let me talk a little bit more about what I see as, as this, uh, I'll call it a supplemental system and an opt-in we want to do better legal system. And so I, you know, I start with the idea that it's, to me, this has to be an entirely voluntary process. Because if it is, if it has any sort of coercive element in it, you're gonna encounter two problems. One is a, a pragmatic problem and two is a philosophical problem. The pragmatic problem is, like I mentioned, it's just you're, you're seriously limiting the effectiveness of your collaborative tools uh, if you don't also uh, work really hard to develop among the people a collaborative mindset. And then the philosophical problem that I think bringing any sort of coercive element into this opt-in system is that to me that is bringing the power of the state into a place where it doesn't belong. So I mentioned before this idea of the law establishing this floor, this I like to call it with it, you know, we'll let the we'll let you be this bad to each other before you suffer any consequence. And then if you drop below that, if you're now this bad to each other, then, then there's going to be some consequences. I, I actually, if I may, just... Yeah. I, I wonder if there's also a ceiling in that, that there's both a floor and a ceiling. You talk about being able to do more than what's on the floor right. uh, or what the floor allows, but is there also a ceiling that allows you to only do less than what is allowed in some ways? That's a good question. And, and candidly, 
one that I have not considered before. Um, I, I, I think you certainly have to think about the potential for a ceiling. I know we haven't gotten there yet. Um, or, and, and maybe I misunderstood your question. You know, are you asking, is, is, there, is there a ceiling into what you can do through that formal coercive state system? I'm wondering if, if what you're depicting as sort of the floor is, here's how bad you can be. This is as bad as you can be. But also, here's how much freedom you've got. And this is as free as you can be. And, and therefore, there are limitations in what you can do without you know, going beyond whatever rules are in place to, to limit. Right. Well, <clears throat> From a from a legal theory point, with with the the way you ended your question, then the answer is no. Because the you know when the law draws a boundary line, it it's saying that as long as you stay within that boundary, you are fine. And I think this is still a universal part of every U.S. law student's first year contract curriculum, which is that as long as you are not agreeing to do something illegal, then you can through what's identified as private law, you can create your own system. And as long as it's not illegal, it's, it's a legal agreement. So if, if that's the way we're talking about the parameters, mm -hmm. then no, okay. there is no ceiling. Um, but, you know, the ceiling is our imagination, really. And that's the space, really, that you're talking about us moving towards. Is that correct? Right. Because I think navigating that space is actually an incredibly complex exercise because you're dealing with really difficult problems and uh, you're dealing with humans that are experiencing these real difficult problems. And humans, as Jose and I were talking about before people came on, we're very complicated creatures. Um, and we get pulled in a lot of different directions, uh, a lot of which are not necessarily going to be conducive to working with each other. When you, when you look at uh, what is the lawyer's role in this add-on system, it's now not to be a gladiator, not to advocate for one party on behalf of another, it's to be a facilitator, it's to help foster communication between the parties and help everybody get to the goal that is, is in front of them. And so the, the question about you know, competition versus collaboration, and, and I, I, I I think it's interesting that you identify that as a custom because it is a custom, it's just the way we do things. But the, as I think more and more people are recognizing the value of uh, working together, and, and I believe we're already starting to see this, that custom will change. Glenn, I just want to sort of, um, I think you've done a very good job of sort of defining the space that you're working in because it, it's not just the movements, but that the movements are playing in this legal space. And I think that's really a, a, an interesting way to frame it because those of us who aren't thinking from a legal standpoint um, don't have that clarity that you've just given us. So thank you for that. But um, the question that we always ask and we try to, to get from people is, how does that manifest into a day-to-day -day experience 24 years from today, how is the average person going to experience their lives differently if these movements take hold, if these movements really make the difference that we all are, you know, depending on the movements we're involved in, that we all hope they will make? Mm -hmm. What do you see? Um, what do you see as the difference? I, I believe that... <clears throat> it will guide people in general to a much more uh, intentional and aware 
approach to their relationships with each other. I think that one of the, the side effects of the, the way we do legal relationships right now is that it takes away um, some of, I'm not sure if it, it's more removing an incentive or a need, but, it, but it's, it's convincing people that the solution to their relationship lies in a piece of paper instead of working with each other. So I was, when we were talking about getting ready for today, I was telling you about this parlor trick that I will do sometimes when I'm uh, giving presentations, which is I will ask people um, to just give me a one word answer to what they are looking for when they, uh, when they come to a lawyer and say, I need a contract relating to my business. And then I've got uh, a, a slide loaded up already with one word on it. Um, and the word is protection. And I, I'm not batting a thousand on that parlor trick, but I'm, I'm you know, 70, 80%, somewhere in there. Um, and usually when it's not that exact word, it comes back around to that idea of protection, safety. So we've created this system where I think it's really easy for people to sign a legal agreement and say, okay, the, the relationship is taken care of. We've covered everything. And if something goes wrong, then we'll, we'll follow our plan. Now, what's interesting about a conscious contract is you kind of walk into it saying, we have no plan, right? So if something goes wrong, I'm not pulling out a piece of paper that tells me, okay, who feels the pain from this thing that goes wrong? I'm still pulling out a piece of paper, but now it's reminding me of what I promised to do when things go wrong which is reach out and have a conversation with my partners uh, and work through it together to be in relationship with each other. So, so I think that if you think about a system where relations are much more governed by ad hoc private agreements, then it, it compels people to actually pay attention to how am I showing up in this relationship? What do I, you know, what do I want to do? Is the relationship still serving us? All of those tough questions that really underlie a lot of legal disputes, but, but we, don't, we don't access those areas currently. But I, I think that's what's ahead of us. So, maybe I can paraphrase that because I, I just heard it kind of I said a lot of words you did and um, I, I may have lost a little bit of the picture and so sure. I, I just want to be clear what you're what I think you're describing is the fact that when we write legal documents in part we're taking away the responsibility from the parties and imbuing the document with the responsibility. Is that a fair way to describe it? Yeah, absolutely. And so the parties then become in of, in of themselves sort of disconnected from the problem because the problem or the responsibility for the problem lies with the legal document and the framework in which that document was created. Is that? Yeah, no, you, 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 you distilled it down very well. And so now you're saying that needs to be back to the individuals and the individuals need to take that responsibility back, not only for what they said they were going to do, but for how they're going to address issues that come up when they try to do what they're going to do. And exactly. that's really, you think that's the, the heart of, of the work that needs to be done 
and how things change. People are now consciously connected, consciously aware of, of what, and, and responsible of what they said they were gonna do and that they, it's their responsibility to maintain that relationship. Right. And then to me, the, the, the magic part of making that switch and putting that responsibility back on the people is that you, you've, you've moved from, at least in theory, predefining your outcome to, um, to a place where you, you walk in asking the question of, what do we want to create from this? Uh, and so I, I think conflict is an interesting thing because it, uh, it's very uncomfortable. Um, it's, it's not particularly pleasant, but when I think back on a lot of the greatest learning that I've had, uh, it's come out of situations where things that I think are really vigorously challenged and, uh, and that's conflict. So when you find a way to, um, engage in conflict that has some of the unpleasantness taken out of it. And I think the unpleasantness kind of comes from, again, it's the framework of it's me versus you, and we're fighting over this fixed thing to, well, it's me and you, and we got a problem, and how are we going to respond to it actually uh, allows you to turn conflict from kind of this entropic exercise to a generative exercise. Um, and, and that's what I think is pretty cool. So now I'm 24 years from today trying to do a partnership with uh, a colleague um, or coming together to create a new organization or building a partnership between different organizations. And I'm thinking less about how do I protect myself? How do I you know, make this a legal issue, a, an issue of how we're gonna fight over it at some point and yeah. think about how I take, keep the responsibility and start building these relationships in a more conscious way, in a more collaborative way. Right. And it's really what I'm hearing is, is it's about changing the framework that we're working in um, and the expectation of, of that framework. So that what we then are doing is saying, we're sitting at the table together, not in an effort to protect ourselves from future harm, but in an effort to go down this path together. Right. And, and then that will also have the side effect of protecting us from future harm. Exactly, exactly. Because we're doing it collaboratively. And right. That's the, and that's the intent there, right? Yeah. So I, I, I could, I'm enjoying this conversation a lot. So I could go on for hours, but I know we- Me too. We, we've got 10 minutes uh, and then we wanna kind of wrap it up. But okay. I, I wanna, well, actually give, give uh, the others uh, a chance to ask some questions. But I, I want to kind of see where you've uh, seen in your work in both the legal space and the, and the business space, what other movements are you seeing that we need that to happen as well in order for this to work? So what, what else is out there that you're going, well, if we didn't have that, or if we don't have that, we're never going to get to the same place that I think we should get. You know, I'm not sure what this movement is called, but the recognition that we do not separate uh, our work from our humanity and, and that um, this idea of things are quote unquote, just a business is just, just a, a falsehood that that needs to continue um, vigorously. And, and I, I feel pretty good that people 
have that covered. Like I, right. I see that really moving forward. But um, anything that really has to do with bringing a more holistic approach to kind of our formal relations. And, you know, I say these things about the business context and, and they apply in other contexts too. I mean, you don't have business relationships and personal relationships. You have human relationships. Some of them exist in your personal life. Some of them exist in your business life, but they're all relationships. Right. And that goes back to the wholeness again. Right. And that's part of what I think Society 2045 is really trying to get at the root of, because those of us involved in different movements, we see the world through that lens that we're really only doing the same few things. We're connecting to our humanity, connecting to each other, and creating systems that help us connect to our humanity and connect to mm -hmm. each other. Yeah. Because, because everything is a manifestation of that, isn't it? It, it, it absolutely is. Yeah, so I, I, I think I have one more thing I wanna make sure that I drop in and, and then you know uh, I wanna take questions. So the one more thing I, I wanna take in is, like I said early on, I've, I've kind of recently been invited into conversations that have led me to think about this on a more macro level. And, and I think then you start to see a, a really interesting opportunity for, uh, for the people who want to opt in to this, this good movement. So let me give you a, uh, an example. There is a carpet manufacturing company uh, based out of their, their main factory is outside of Atlanta. Uh, and they've been on a 30 year climate journey. 30 years ago, their founder recognized that he was killing the planet and said, I got to stop that. So yeah, they uh, put together this environmental dream team uh, that included biomimicry experts and just looked at everything they did and say, how can we take the waste out of this? And they got to the point by 2020 um, where they had gotten to, they were carbon neutral. The name of the company is Interface Carpet. Super dirty industry and they've gotten to carbon neutral. And then they said, well, what more can we do? You know, how can we start actually not just not, just not cause harm, but how do we heal? So now they are actively looking at when we build a factory, how do we make our factory do what the forest was doing before we put a factory on it? Which I think is a really interesting approach to the issue. So somebody who's demonstrated that kind of uh, commitment to environmental issues, is are any of us really concerned when they build a new factory that they are not going to continue to behave the way they behave, that it's gonna be a good thing. And so then you start to say, let's go back to this, this existing system, which is entirely based on the idea that we can't trust each other. So company, if you wanna build a factory, we can't trust that you're not gonna ruin the planet. So you have to go through all of this the regulatory requirements so that we can give you permission to do that. I think if you develop this add-on legal system that has different sets of agreed upon standards for how do you do things better, whether that's your environmental behavior, whether that's your hiring and employment practices, uh, whether that's you know your, your corporate governance, anything, that those standards can then become a substitute for a lot of the real pain in the butt regulations that uh, businesses find as, as a high friction point for, for their work. So, you know, once you, the, the, the real change is moving from a system where you just assume that nobody can trust anybody and move into a system where you say, no, actually trust, really fuels our relationships. Um, once you have demonstrated that you've earned trust, what should that mean for how you experience this other system? I, I think there is 
a lot of potential there. And, and so that just makes me want to dig a little deeper there, because what you've just described sounds like when you say trust, mm -hmm. that it has to be about that there's adequate number of connections, of human connections, in order for that trust, one, to emerge, and two, to be maintained. Because right. it's, it's not, I trust you, and I'm not connected to you anymore, right? You, you go build whatever, and then, well, what happens? Right. Is it fair to say that it's the experience of connection, of constant connection, constant engagement, that is the solution, not in itself just, I trust you now, but that it's that constant engagement? Yeah, because trust is 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 not fixed, right? It it will vary, and it's it's connection that continues to allow people to build and maintain trust. So, I, absolutely, I think I think this this system, and and I apologize because I don't think I've expressed it really clearly because. Quite frankly, right now, it's a pretty hazy picture in my mind. Um, but I, I think that what this system really is about is how do you create some, some formal processes that support that kind of ongoing connection? Yeah, yeah. And I think that, that right there is what you've just talked about today. It it's encapsulates that um to me at least but let's see what the other folks think yeah well i have a i have a question so we you talked about the civil situation right where people have civil disagreements and and lawyers become peacemakers as as um as kim likes to say you said facilitators is just good a word and um what about the criminal cases mm -hmm. will there be Will criminal cases be considered criminal cases in 2045? Uh, you know, if this thing comes to fruition. And um, what would you say about that? I'll just stop there. Yeah. Um, the, the criminal area is not one that I've had a huge focus on, but I'm, I'm aware of it. Uh, and and the most interesting thing that I'm aware of in the criminal context, as far as a shift in legal approaches, is, is the opportunity for restorative work between offenders and victims. Um, that seems to be growing. I have no reason to think that that won't continue to grow. And so again, I think you know the, there'll always be a piece of the system that is reserved for people who don't opt into a more restorative or, or a more collaborative system, because I don't think we can force anybody to do that system. So, you know, I don't think we're getting rid of jails anytime soon, but I think they're going to be a lot smaller. Yeah, and they are, they are in the uh, in Netherlands and they are in the, you know, Denmark as well. In, in Germany as well, yeah. And they're very different. The other thing you said that was interesting. You said the adversarial bleeds over collaborative, the collaborative approach, and it's all based on the, on the violence that the government has. I think you said the force of the state or the power of the state, but it's the power of the state to put you in jail, which is commit violence, right? Um, can you say more about that adversarial creeping? Because that's a fear that we all have is that we'll see these movements and then they'll be taken over by the adversarial, by the dominant uh, way of thinking. Yeah. Um, the dominating uh, is what I meant to say, way of thinking. So um, can you say something about that? Um, yeah, I think that's going to keep happening. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, uh, so I, I, um, I was at an event last week and I spoke to people about collaborative law and somebody that I knew was in the audience then came up and talked to me afterwards and said, yeah, I've heard a lot about this from, from collaborative divorce. And I know it's an idea that, that really attracts people. 
And, and then she said, you know, the thing is though, I have never known anybody who's entered into a collaborative divorce where it's actually worked. And my answer to that on no evidence is that it's likely exactly that issue that people have nominally said, well, we're going to be collaborative, but then they haven't been collaborative. And, and, you know, I think that's, it's, it's a time, it's a time thing to me on that, Matt. It's just, that's a, you know, keep swinging the ax at the tree and it, and eventually people will, will really be it and not just say it. So in other words, Lynn, maybe it's, uh, they had a collaborative divorce, but not a collaborative marriage. <laughs> Fair. Yeah. Stuart, you it looks like you had some questions, Stuart. The critical thing that I want to ask is uh, so you're in big law, is greatly driven, driven by a factory model of billable hours, which is part of the, you know, the, the, what really is has moved law in some ways from a, a, a profession to an industry and business. What's what level of receptivity are you getting um, among your your partners, among your colleagues? Because you're you know you're pushing against a model. Because in some ways, you know, big law are the folks that are advising you know the captains of industry. Mm -hmm. And can have a huge impact on the mindset. So yeah, and and I mean, for whatever reason, I've found myself in the position where um, I'm like, okay, how do I work on this from the end of like attracting the current system into some change? And I so first off, my my question, my answer to your question about what has the reception been has been I, I would say the best word for it is curious which is maybe a little better than I expected and not resistant that doesn't mean everybody there or even most people there or even that many people there are really looking at how can we do things in in a genuinely innovative way in the law but there's there's a good amount of openness to it. I mean, to be you know just very candid, I you know had a conversation with the general counsel's office, and I said, "Here's my practice, and here's what I'm looking to develop. And if there's going to be a problem, let's find out about that now." And they were like, "No, we you know we're we're not sure it's going to work, but we're not going to stop you from trying." Yeah, it's a, it's an interesting phenomenon. Around 2001, um, I did a presentation to the to the DRI, which is uh, the trade group for defense attorneys. Sure, and and spoke about all the ideas that you're talking about and got a standing ovation. All right, which just shocked the hell out of me. That being said, systemic change. <laughs> is real challenging. People know mm. that it's the right thing to do. It's the good thing to do. And yet they just keep doing what they're doing. I think you can make a very good case that there is a really good business opportunity for a big law firm to come in and say, we see where things are going and we're going to get out on the leading edge and, and we're going to be the people who are taking this hazy idea that Glenn has and figuring out how to really make it work, right? Yeah, one of the, one of the things that, that, that I'm aware of that there were some firms, large firms doing a number of years ago is they would actually you know, have um, two groups working on a big case. One was litigating and there was a Chinese, they built a Chinese wall. One was litigating and one was trying to resolve it and and in fee structures they built in bonuses for resolving things uh more quickly um, right yeah yeah and mm -hmm. you can you can i mean it's just how you put the incentives together you want to change lawyer behavior the have the people who pay them say we need you to behave this way you need 
the law firms to change their mindset about what's doable and what's possible. You need the lawyers in those law firms to change <laughs> what's doable and what's possible. And you need the clients to change what's doable and what's possible. And you can't, it, any one of those isn't in alignment and it's not gonna move very quickly in that direction. I mean, we'll make small steps like your partner said, or the general counsel said, yeah, sure, we don't think it'll work, but go ahead. In other words, it, you don't have a whole lot of support there, um, at least not active support. It may be yeah. permissive, permission, but certainly not aid. No, I think that, that you've, you've assessed that accurately. Um, and I, I, so, you know, here's the question. I mean, I know how to get their support, like generate business out of it. Um, and so that's, you know, some of the conversations I'm having, I, I, I got this crazy idea the other night that, um, you know, what's, what's really sort of needed is, is a think tank about this stuff. And that, oh, I don't know, you know, maybe a bunch of, uh, of business people, you know, who have can pool some resources and go to, oh, I don't know, some large law firm somewhere and say, hey, uh, you know, we want to partner with you to create this think tank. And oh, by the way, here's the guy who's going to run it. You know, I, I, I mean, I, if it, it's just that there's, there's ways to pull the, the traditional levers for non-traditional purposes. So I, we've hit the 11 o'clock hour, and that means that we've run out of time, except Stuart's got a finger. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just want to punctuate what Glenn said about um, get business um, in the sense that client demand uh, is what's going to drive this, period. What Stuart said, I'll tell you one way where Kim and I really part ways is Kim hates lawyer jokes. I love lawyer jokes. Um, I think I've got a lot to learn from them. Uh, and my favorite lawyer joke um, is about uh, using lawyers as experimental test subjects uh, instead of rats. And there's a host of reasons for why you do that. But the, uh, the answer is, you know, there's some things you just can't pay a rat to do. Yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> so say okay i'm gonna turn that component on its head i'm just gonna tell them yeah i'm gonna pay you to do this stuff but do you know do good stuff so but can they do it sorry i was just saying can they do it just for pay when they're where their mindset their framework they're still working in like could i could someone in the old con or pardon me old framework actually do a real conscious contract not if they're not if they're stuck in the old framework yeah which is why part of saying here's what you've got to do to earn this money is you have to really actually adopt the other framework you have to be conversant in it right right the, yep. the same way, you know, you might need to know patent law, you might need to know contract law, you might need to know trademark law, whatever. You also need to know adversarial mindset and collaborative mindset. So, so Glenn, one question. Why, why did you mention the think tank? I mean, you, you kind of passed through this idea of starting a law firm that, that is more made up of, of peacemakers or, or mm -hmm. whatever and try to get a business going around that. That to me is more actionable than a think tank. A think tank, think tank is you write papers, you talk about it and blah, blah, blah. And uh, like Mark said, there's this, this woman with, with this think tank has been around for many years and I just don't see the impact. So, but if, yeah. if it were a law firm that did that, it would be unique for now. And that, that sounds very appealing to me. I know that people want something different. And I have a good idea about some of the big tent poles about what makes it different. But in terms of, to go back to Jose's question, how do you turn that into a system where people live differently on a day-to-day -day basis? There's a lot of work to do there. And, and so that's the work that I'm talking about doing 
and whether it's in the context of something called a think tank or if the law firm saying this is a project that we're undertaking yeah. it that i think is is where we're at in the work it's i i have come to realize that that conscious contracts in terms of a you know a small group relationship or a one-on-one -on -one relationship that's proof of concept and now how do you take that concept of what happens when we say focusing on relationship is a part of legal and make that big we've had a great conversation glenn thank you so much for My uh, making yourself available having had the time and the the thought to to come prepared to have this great conversation because it sounds like you've really been not only thinking about what you're doing but thinking about how to evolve what you've been doing which is i think beautiful work yeah and i really appreciated the conversation as well because as i've i've started to ask myself these other questions i've realized that one of the things i really need is people to ask me hard questions <laughs> So I appreciate just uh, everybody leaning into the dialogue about this and, and you know, helping put the stuff out there that's, that's going to lead to the creation of the world that we're all looking for. All right. That's the bottom line. That's it.